Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert in Arlington. Masked men, riot police, and other forms of state repression are currently being used against protests in Egypt. But the protests continue and are entering their second week. It actually looks like the repression of the protests is only fueling them. The person who is said to have launched this latest wave of protests, Mohamed Ali, who is based in Spain, called on protesters to gather not only in Tahrir Square in Cairo, but also at the Pyramids of Gaza, among other locations. With thousands arrested by the police and an unknown, unknown number of protesters injured or perhaps even killed, authorities demand that hospitals provide information on the injured protesters uh, that are receiving treatment so that they can be arrested in the hospitals. Also, Alaa Fa Abdel Fattah, who is one of the leading symbols of the 2011 Tahrir Revolution, was recently arrested. On Friday, thousands participated in a demonstration in support of President Assisi. Assisi himself attended the demonstration and responded to accusations of corruption made by the demonstrators against him. This is an image being painted as was done before, comprised of lies and defamation and some media working to present an image that isn't true. We're really strong. The country is really strong. Strong because of you. Why? Because of God. And because of you. So don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. <laughs> I am telling you, and I am telling Egyptians. The day that I asked something of Egyptians, just like the day they delegated me in 2013, July 3rd, the day that I asked something of Egyptians will be a message to the whole world because millions will take to the streets. Millions, nothing less. Thank you very much. Joining me now to discuss the ongoing wave of protests in Egypt is Angela Joya. She teaches in the Department of International Studies at the University of Oregon and joins us today from Doha, Qatar. Her most recent book is The Roots of Revolt, A Political Economy of Egypt from Nasser to Mubarak. Thanks for joining us again, Angela. Thanks, Greg. So when we had you on last week, the demonstrations were only beginning. At the time, you said that they were smaller than the mass protests of 2011. Now, despite the smaller size, the police are not able to stop them so far, and the protests continue to spread, it seems. So what is fueling them? Well, I guess, first of all, um, the protests, we expected them maybe to be a bit bigger, uh, but they're not as big as we expected because uh, the police blocked um, all the main thoroughs, uh, thoroughfares and avenues to Tahrir Square in Egypt. So they physically prevented people from coming. But uh, nonetheless, uh, we saw a sporadic number of people showing up um, in different parts of uh, Cairo protesting. Um, but more, um, I guess, more importantly, in smaller towns outside of uh, Cairo, uh, in other provinces, there were protests where the police presence is not as heavy um, and the police uh, focus was mostly concentrated inside Cairo. Um, they continue coming, um, I have to say, because uh, the conditions that people are experiencing um, are not necessarily ideal. Uh, talking to Egyptians, reading mostly about their daily lives, um, the, as I mentioned in the last uh, batch of interview, the conditions of austerity are quite uh, harsh on a lot of Egyptians. Uh, 40 million uh, Egyptians are uh, suffering from basically poverty level uh, life conditions. Cost of living has gone dramatically high. Uh, people cannot access uh, daily necessities. Um, and so we see the pressure mostly now even on the middle class, uh, which previously did not suffer to the same extent. And so they are now also um, experiencing what majority of the uh, working class Egyptians have experienced um, in the last 10 years or so since uh, the uprisings initially began in Egypt. Now, strangely enough, the Egyptian stock exchange uh, increased quite suddenly, presumably in response to the central bank having cut interest rates by 100 basis points on Thursday last week. Now, how do you explain the rising stocks with the protests continuing on in the streets? Um, well, we, I have to admit that over the last uh, 15 years or so that I've been studying Egypt, uh, somehow there is a disconnect between the reality of lives of people, uh, the harsh reality they experience, and the reality of the stock markets. Um, 
and how they keep uh, rising uh, because there's a trust that the more uh, repressive the regime becomes, the harsher uh, they suppress protests, uh, the, the markets tend to respond more positively. Um, and so it's in some ways uh, the nature of uh, capitalist development in the Middle East and North Africa, where these in these perverse ways we see a celebration by uh, uh, investors, uh, the more they see repression by the state. Uh, and, and in my book, I discuss this as the, the rise of new liberal authoritarianism, where you see the, the support and expansion of uh, capitalist markets um, under the auspices of a regime that is really successful at crushing protests um, or public demands for rights uh, and social justice. Now, another interesting development is that the city of Suez became one of the more prominent centers of the protests over the past week. Why Suez? Um, so Suez has historically uh, been very impoverished and left out um, of uh, government subsidies or government social services. Um, and around Suez, uh, I also look at uh, Sinai, for instance, North and South Sinai. Um, these are uh, governorates where poverty rates are much higher and the, the government doesn't necessarily pay attention. Um, we have to also say that most of the attention of the government when it comes to subsidies or social services, it's focused on uh, major mega cities like Cairo and Alexandria where they fear that a mass uprising could occur and that could stabilize the government. So the neglect of these other smaller cities has been uh, a part of the Egyptian recent history. Um, so that's that's one factor that they are coming out. Um, I, I don't want to necessarily uh, feed into uh, what the government discourse has been that uh, places like Suez might have a number of uh, supporters of Muslim Brotherhood who might be coming out, but it's possible possible that there is also uh, sympathizers of Muslim Brotherhood in these smaller towns who feel more confident uh, that with the absence of security forces, their heavy presence in these smaller towns, they can actually come out and protest. Um, we have to remember that when Mohamed Morsi was overthrown, in the memory of modern Egypt or of contemporary Egypt, there's still this uh, grievance, deep grievance, that the only democratically elected government was overthrown by a coup, uh, by the military. And so a majority of Egyptians who did support Morsi, uh, they are still quite upset about that. They still hold that as their only democratic election and the, their only democratic president. Mm. Now, what do you think is the more likely outcome at this moment if these prote protests continue and continue to grow, perhaps? Um, I would say, I mean, based on these recent news uh, out coming out of uh, Egypt, uh, the government has arrested now over 2,000 um, protesters uh, and activists. Uh, as, as you noticed, uh, you mentioned in the initial part of this interview, um, Al Abdel Fattah, who had been arrested in the first part of uh, the revolutions in early 2011, um, has been arrested again. He spent five years in jail and now they've taken him again into custody. So there is a bit of a uh, clean sweep by the government going after any potential suspect that might stir protests in Egypt. Um, and they're trying to quash that. They're trying to prevent that um, any possible of such a mass uprising that could take place. So I'm not so sure that we would see such big level of uprising in Egypt as we did in 2011, but we might see these kind of sporadic outbursts of anger on the street um, from time to time. Uh, one thing is for sure that with this recent accusations by Mohammed Ali, this uh, military contractor, and the way that uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi responded, uh, it has definitely uh, destabilized the trust that Abdel Fattah al Sisi had with the Egyptians. And so that tarnished uh, image of him now and, and the trust that he had built, um, I think that is also going to fracture uh, the kind of consensus that this government had built um, since 2014 that he's been in power. Mm. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there for now, but we'll continue to uh, follow this uh, developments in Egypt. I was speaking to Angela Joya, professor of international studies at the University of Oregon. Thanks again, Angela, for having joined us today. Thank you, Greg. And thank you for joining the Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.